Pokemon games are packed to the brim with detail. From the region to the Pokemon to the characters, everything is so well researched and has so much meaning behind it that it's practically impossible to be aware of it all, which is a real shame. There are plenty of underappreciated details in the Pokemon games that really make them a whole lot better than you realized, but they just don't get noticed because they're either rather subtle or you have to do some research to really understand what Game Freak was going for. Well, today is all about appreciating these underappreciated hidden details as we're going to highlight 10 of them in today's video, which is all made possible by today's wonderful sponsor, Ridge Wallet. Okay guys, here's the deal. I am here to tell you why you need to get a Ridge wallet and I am going to do it completely improvised. I don't even need a script to tell you how great this thing is because it just comes from the heart. These wallets are freaking amazing. These little babies can hold up to 12 cards plus cash and they do so all while maintaining this really small and compact size so you don't have a behemoth of leather and paper spewing out of your pants like no one wants that. You don't just have to believe me though, that's the nice thing about this, because the Ridge Wallet also has 40,000 five-star reviews online, it comes in over 30 colors and styles, it has RFID blocking technology to keep your credit card information safe, it has a lifetime warranty, and it even comes with a 45-day money-back guarantee if for some reason all of that just doesn't do it for you. On top of all of that, you can even get 10% off on one of these wallets with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com forward slash hoops and entering code hoops at checkout. The link for that is going to be in the description. The people over at Ridge have been supporting the channel for a while now and they're honestly amazing. So be sure to show them some love and pick up a wallet with that link in the description. And thank you again to Ridge for supporting the channel. Dang, I just did that completely script free. That's how much I love these things. First off, let's look at one that doesn't really get displayed in the games, which is an absolute shame because it makes what we're dealing with here so, so much better. Whitney is the infamous gym leader of the Johto region who uses a mill tank, but personality-wise, she's basically a young, almost spoiled rotten kind of girl who gets really upset when you beat her in a battle. But another thing about her that isn't highlighted at all in the games is that she's actually a baseball fan. If you look at her design closely, you can start to see it with the baseball jersey she is wearing and her long baseball-like socks, but this aspect of her character is highlighted no more prominently than in this piece of artwork that appeared on Game Freak's website, where she appears with a full-on baseball mitt and an apalm following behind her carrying a baseball. Now, Apom isn't on Whitney's team in the final games, but this art suggests that maybe it was originally, and maybe it was even her signature Pokemon. It is normal type after all, which is Whitney's type specialty, and the baseball theme makes perfect sense with Apom because that would mean that its big tail hand is sorta of supposed to be a mitt, which again just makes its design kinda make a little more sense. It certainly fits better with Whitney than Miltank does as far as her design goes, so maybe this was something that they kind of abandoned after wanting to make Whitney a little tougher, thus replacing Apom with Miltank. This makes both Apom and Whitney way cooler in my opinion, and it would be very interesting to know if this was actually the original intent with them. Speaking of gym leaders in Johto, let's talk about Chuck, because this guy is most likely named after Chuck Norris. Given the name, obviously, and the martial arts inspiration, it's pretty likely. So, we literally have a Chuck Norris character in Pokemon, and, like, nobody talks about that? 
I feel like if Chuck had been introduced in the age of social media, this would have immediately become a meme and he would be a god tier character in the community. But since that wasn't the case, I feel like this kind of just gets overlooked most of the time, which is a real travesty because hello, we literally have a Chuck Norris character in Pokemon. Transitioning from Johto to Hoenn, Hoenn took a big step in its own direction in following up the first two generations when it was first introduced, making a clean break from the continuity that Kanto and Johto had established, and just kinda did its own thing. This is definitely evident with the look and feel of Hoenn, as it has a very fresh vibe to it, but Game Freak were really going all in on this perspective, even right down to some of the finer details of the game. A couple of these details have to do with Little Root Town, where you start your adventure in Ruby and Sapphire. If you locate Little Root Town on the region map, its map description will state that Basking amid vibrant nature, this simple town is not shaded with any one hue. This is a very clear jab at the first two generations, since both Kanto and Johto use colors as the inspiration for the names of their towns. So Little Root Town, right from the beginning of the game, is basically staking a claim that we're not resting on our laurels this time around. We're going and doing our own thing. We're doing something different. So this is a very symbolic description for Little Root Town to have. Additionally, you could even say that Little Root Town's name is consistent with this as well, as this region has little roots that connect back to the previous two games, if any at all. The fact that this is where you start your game makes it all the more fitting cause it's setting the stage for what you're about to experience, so overall it's a really cool detail that doesn't really get talked about. Jumping into a region that also does its own thing, Alola is a place that is very unique in the Pokemon world. So unique in fact that they just barely set up their Pokemon League and Elite Four by the time the games take place, and one of those Elite Four members is Kahili. It's easy to forget about Kahili because she's the only member of Alola's Elite Four that you don't see elsewhere in the game, but she probably has the most ingenious design of them all. Kahili's design revolves around a theme of golf, and she specializes in flying types. This seems like an unrelated combination at first, but it's actually very intentional and very clever. As a golfer, Kahili gets her flying type from the fact that many of the shots in golf are named after birds. For example, if you hit a 1 under par, you got a birdie, if you shot a 2 under par, you got an eagle, and if you shoot a 3 under par, it's called an albatross. This honestly is a genius design choice that I absolutely love, and Kahili even carries a golf club whose pattern on the handle matches that of Toucanon's beak, one of her Pokemon, for a beautiful cherry on top. It doesn't get much better than this in the character design department, which is exactly why it deserves to be appreciated more. Despite doing its own thing, Alola also has a lot of parallels to Kanto, and one interesting thing about Kanto is Giovanni. Giovanni is Kanto's final gym leader, but also the leader of its evil team, Team Rocket, so he is extremely prominent within those games. One thing about him though that I have never heard said about him is that Giovanni's Pokemon all have a type advantage against a majority of the rest of Team Rocket. Giovanni uses ground types, while the rest of Team Rocket uses mostly poison type Pokemon, which are weak to ground. We obviously can't say if this was intentional or not, but either way it's very symbolic of the fact that Giovanni is the boss and his underlings stand no chance against him. Giovanni was already a pretty cool character before this, so this just makes him all the cooler. Another detail about Kanto that hides in plain sight that you'd have to be super super sharp to notice, hence why it goes underappreciated, occurs in the original Pokemon Red and Blue. As with every other Pokemon game, when you get into a battle, there is a battle transition that occurs from the overworld into the actual battle. 
Well, believe it or not, these transitions actually have a rhyme and a reason to them, as which kind of battle transition you get is intentionally determined by several factors. There are multiple different transitions that can be played, and which one you get is based on whether you're getting into a trainer battle or a wild battle, whether you're in a dungeon map like a cave, and whether the Pokemon you are battling is at least three levels stronger than your Pokemon. This is the kind of thing that really makes a game great, because it didn't have to be done. No one would have noticed or cared if these transitions were the same every time or if they were randomly determined, but the fact that this amount of detail was put into something so small deserves to be appreciated, especially because it hardly gets noticed at all. Next, let's look at the latest Pokemon generation. Generation 8 gave us access to the Galar region, and just like everything else in Pokemon, Galar has been thoroughly analyzed to uncover its origins and inspirations. There have been many suggestions for where the name Galar could possibly come from, and there is one possible explanation that seems to fit very well, and is also pretty ingenious. Galar, in addition to being the name of this Pokemon region, is also a word in Irish and Scottish dialects that roughly translates to disease. Now, the reason why this fits so well might not immediately come to mind, but it actually all has to do with Eternatus. Eternatus is a central figure in Pokemon Sword and Shield because not only is it a legendary Pokemon and a major boss battle within the game, but it also is the source of the game's central mechanic, Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing. So I don't think it's any surprise that Eternatus is also a poison type, and its influence has infected the Galar region, helping it to give it its name. Speaking of Galar, one Pokemon that this region introduced is Orbeetle. Orbeetle is a fun Pokemon because it's basically a mad scientist ladybug, but the coolest thing about Orbeetle by far is the parallel it seems to have with the other ladybug Pokemon. There are two other ladybug Pokemon currently in existence, Ladyba and Ladyan and Orbeetle seems that it is meant to be the villain to Lady Anne's hero. As we have already said, Orbeetle is a mad scientist, which is very villain-like, which would leave Lady Anne as the hero. This isn't obvious right off the bat, but it's very possible that Ledian was meant to be sort of a superhero-like Pokemon from the very beginning, as it looks very much like Ultraman, especially in the eyes. Ultraman is a Japanese superhero media franchise, and is actually one of the things that helped to inspire Pokemon as a franchise. So Orbeetle, with its mad scientist design, basically completed a ladybug superhero supervillain dynamic that we never knew even existed or that we even needed, but it is incredibly awesome and a super cool part about this Pokemon's design. I guess we'll continue to stick with Galar for a little bit longer, and next up, talk about Galarian Zigzagoon. This is a point I actually mentioned in a recent video as well, so I'll kind of just summarize it here, but basically, while Hoenian Zigzagoon is based on a Japanese Tanuki, Galarian Zigzagoon and its line are based on a European Badger. This makes sense because Galar is based in Europe, but when you dig a little deeper into these Pokemon is when they start to get really cool. The word Tanuki, depending on where you are in Japan, can actually either refer to the Japanese raccoon dog, for whom the name is more commonly associated with, but it can also refer to badgers. So depending on the region of Japan you're in, this name varies in its application, perfectly fitting into Galarian Zigzagoon's design and with it being a regional variant. It gets even crazier though with Galarian Zigzagoon's evolution, Obstagoon, because while it's clearly based on Gene Simmons from the band Kiss, it also fits in with the mythical Tanuki and its ability to transform into a human. 
So not only does Galarian Zigzagoon have its own inspirations that fit with European culture, but it's still entirely consistent with its original inspiration in the Tanuki, which is mind-blowingly incredible in my opinion, and makes them way better than just your basic regional variant. Pokemon Black and White have a ton of things that go underappreciated, due to it being the most divisive generation of its time. One super cool detail of these games that is right in front of your face, or ears rather, but most of the time goes unnoticed, has to do with some of the game's music. The theme for Route 2 and 3 in Unova is dynamic, and is synced to the player's movement. If the player is moving, you'll hear a nice marching drum in the theme that symbolizes you marching out on this new adventure. However, whenever you're standing still, this bit of percussion goes away. This is an amazing attention to detail that really adds so much to the experience once you actually notice it, and it deserves to be noticed way more than it generally is. I'm personally not sure if this occurs with any of the other route themes in this game as well, but it's possible. So if you're aware of any other examples of this, be sure to let us know in the comments below. And there we have it! Those are some underappreciated hidden details in Pokemon games. Which one of these do you think is the coolest? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. I'll be back with another one very soon, and until then, as always, thank you all for watching, I love you very much, and I will smell you guys later.